Welcome to Barry Aftercare, where tonight we are tackling the topic of obesity. Whose fault is it anyway? I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I have noticed a change in the approaches that a lot of healthcare professionals seem to be taking when it comes to addressing obesity for so long. And I would, I would say still, very, very sadly, it's very often the case that medical professionals approach people who struggle with extra weight in pretty rude and dismissive ways, at least from what I hear from the many, many patients that I talk to. You know, according to my patients and a lot of people that you've probably talked to as well, doctors seem to use the excuse for having extra weight as the reason for every single thing, any medical concern a patient has. Well, times they are a changing, my friends. It seems that I hear this, and I put in quotes, obesity is not your fault, being shouted from the medical professional's rooftops. I hear it more and more often. I see it on social media. I see it in magazine articles and, you know, professional literature. Obesity is not your fault. That's the topic for today. Is obesity somebody or something's fault? And if so, well, who? Who or what is to blame? The things we're going to be talking about tonight, the highlights are what's going on with these recent declarations that obesity is not your fault. We're going to discuss the reminders that obesity is a very, very, very complex disease. It's multifaceted. There are a number of contributing factors. So I don't know, maybe obesity is not your fault. Is completely true, completely false, or maybe there are some nuances in there. We're going to tease that apart a little bit tonight. We'll also talk about those contributing factors. What are some of the contributing factors, the biological, the environmental, behavioral, all kinds of things. Which of these things can you influence? Which of these things can you not? Again, is there fault to be had here? And what are the pros and cons of hearing obesity is not your fault? Well, I want to start with this whole highlight reel, this whole highlight thing. You know, obesity is not your fault. Where to come from? Why are we seeing it so often? I don't know if you are, but I know that I am. And the topic gets me really, really worked up. This is one of the things that I can get pretty emotional about. So not that I don't usually have a ton of passion for the things I'm talking about, but if you hear more passion in my voice tonight, it's because this topic gets me really riled up. And it's in a frustrated kind of way. And let me tell you why. But first, hear this clearly because I want to be very, very clear with my spoiler alert ending here. Research very, very clearly shows that there are a lot of biological factors over which a person truly does not have any control, right? And these things, without a doubt, can contribute to the disease of obesity. And for those things, the patient certainly has no blame or no fault, right? And yet, there are factors involved in the development and maintenance of maintaining a high weight or higher than is healthy for your body that people are accountable for. And that's what gets me riled up, right? Hang on. Before we go into the reasons for this, what seems like a global statement, obesity is not your fault. Let's talk about how medical professionals just might be using this statement, obesity is not your fault, to your advantage. And yes, I'm going to completely own, I have some professional skepticism on my part when it comes to this. I think there is some manipulation on the part of the medical community when it comes to these kinds of things. But let's think about it before we, 
you know, throw all medical professionals under the bus. For a long, long, long time, medical professionals, especially physicians, have had a very bad reputation when it comes to fat shaming and being really critical and harsh and unkind to their patients about weight. I read this article by the National Institute of Health, and part of what they said I'm going to read here. Some doctors are now even reluctant to raise the issue of obesity, lest they be accused of fat shaming by not accepting their patient's proportions, and thereby receive poor approval ratings in an atmosphere or popularity is equated with good health care. Translated, doctors are afraid to even discuss a person's weight with them, lest the person gets on social media and says, my physician is a fat shamer. Don't go to this person. They don't accept me. You know, they made me feel guilty. They made me feel worthless. And there you have it. Now the doctor has a low approval rating and a low social media profile. Doctors don't want that. They can't afford that. So take that piece of information, which was posted by the National Institute of Health, and pair it with the psychological concept referred to as the self-serving bias. What the self-serving bias is when we human beings tend to attribute positive events, things that work to our favor, we attribute those to our own character, right? Oh, I'm so great at this and no wonder, you know, this great thing happened. I'm such a good runner. No wonder I run the, won the race or I'm such a good speller. It's no wonder I won the spelling bee, right? But we attribute negative events to external things. Well, you know, I probably would have won that race, but, or won that ball game, but that uh, really had it in for me. So if I win the race or if I win the game or if I win the competition, it's because of all the good things about my person. But if I don't, well, there's something outside of me that I can blame. So the two main findings about the self-serving bias, which kind of speaks for itself are, if I do something great, I'm going to owe it. I'm going to give myself all the credit. And if something goes not in my favor, it's going to be somebody else's fault. So let's think about this self-servingness when it comes to a physician who's been in, not just a physician, but anybody in the medical professional profession who is at the point where they may be afraid to say, hey, listen, I don't even want to talk about fault when it comes to obesity. There are a lot of factors here. And the patient ends up feeling like, oh, the doctor shamed me or the doctor fat shamed me or the doctor doesn't approve, you know, everything wrong with me is about my weight. So I'm going to give them a poor rating. So they're afraid. So wouldn't it be wise for the doctor to say something any patient would love to hear, obesity is not your fault. Oh my God, I love this doctor. I'm going to give him a five. This is a great person. They really understand. Maybe they don't. Maybe they believe what they're saying. Maybe they don't believe what they're saying. Who knows? But I think in a world where there's a lot of competition for patients and customers and clientele, it would self-serve one to make statements that are going to bring you toward me. I don't know if that's true. I don't know. But I do believe there are also some self-serving things from the perspective of the person who carries the weight too, which we'll get to. And that's not a criticism. That's called human nature. We all operate that way, right? I don't want to look at my part in things. It's so much easier if I can externalize them. So the question 
is, do medical professionals have anything to gain when making the declaration, obesity is not your fault? Well, I think they do, because it sounds much more compassionate to patients. It's much more likely to bring you in the door to my office. And there is a lot of research, for sure, that cannot be disputed. And I agree with this. I agree that there are certain aspects related to the disease of obesity that people cannot control. And the bottom line though, when you see a provider, whether it's a physician, a psychologist, a dietitian, um, an exercise person, a bariatric coach, at some point it's gonna funnel back to one thing and I'm not going to tell you what that is yet, but we will get to it. And you're probably ahead of me and know where I'm going with this, right? So next, when we talk about whether a disease, right? Obesity is a disease. It's a chronic disease. It doesn't go away. It's never going to be cured. We can suspend the progression of the disease. We can hopefully do some prevention work for people prior to their becoming, um, carrying so much weight that their health is endangered. But when we're talking about whether a disease is your fault or not, does it make sense to focus on blame to begin with? So a sister of mine had some severe lung issues going on. Well, the sister, and many of us in my family, myself included, I am a former smoker. My sister is a current smoker. My parents both smoked all of their lives. Aunts, uncles, cousins. We grew up in a, in a, in a world where pretty much everybody we knew smoked. And so children learn what they live. So all six of us siblings at one point or another smoked cigarettes. And some of us have given it up. Some of them haven't. But my sister developed a lung disease and I was ticked, right? I'm like, why didn't you quit smoking, right? I was angry with her and I was blaming her. Her physician told me something really profound and it has helped me and I wanna share it with you. The physician said, you know what? This is not the time to focus on blame. It's a time to focus on treatment. And that made so much sense to me because where was blaming her or blaming my parents or blaming society or the tobacco companies. Where was that gonna get me? Absolutely nowhere. It wasn't gonna help me support her by being angry, which just was a cover for my fear and my anxiety about her health, all of our health, right? So let's, let's take that example of smoking for just a few minutes, all right? We'll take this out of the arena of obesity. Smoking, is not good for you. It leads to other diseases, right? Who's to blame for smoking? Is it tobacco companies? Is it your genetics, which may, you know, we've all heard stories of, you know, Grandpa Joe, who lived in 95, smoked three packs of cigarettes a day, never had a lung problem in his life. And then we have somebody in their 30s who gets lung cancer after smoking for five years. I mean, who do we blame? Do we blame genetics? Do we blame our parents who smoked? Do we blame their their parents, our grandparents who smoked? Do we blame the uh, tobacco field growers, the farmers? You know, and does it make a difference? Will it help the person who's got the illness? Let's also talk about black lung disease. You may or may not be familiar with black lung disease. It's a coal worker's form of pneumonia called pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconiosis. Not sure if that's how it's pronounced, but it's more commonly known as black lung disease, and it occurs as a result of coal dust being inhaled. And continued exposure of the coal dust causes some scarring in the lungs, and a lot of people died from it back in the day, and probably still do. I'm not familiar but it's very common among coal miners. So who are we gonna blame for this? Are we gonna blame these families for living in the area where for a lot of time being a coal miner was possibly the only option these people had for income? 
Are we going to blame their parents because they all worked in the coal mines and you followed in your parents' footsteps? Are we going to blame the coal mining companies because they're the ones making all the money and the profit off of this stuff? Who are we going to blame? Blaming somebody. What if you do us any good? One more quick example. Addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction. I sat in some group with some post-op patients who were very judgmental toward alcoholics. And why can't they just push away from the table? And why don't they just not pick up a drink? And, you know, the drug addicts, why do they just, you know, put it down, walk away? And while I will say food addiction and sex addiction or the availability of food, because food and sex are biological needs of a person and they can lead to problems more easily. I'll give you that. But for one person who's struggling with an issue to be judgmental of another is really not okay, right? It's not okay for the drug addict to be judgmental of the person who carries extra weight. It's not okay for a person who has the disease of obesity to be judgmental toward an alcoholic. It's just not okay either way. So let's keep the focus on ourselves here, right? And let's look at the function that blame plays here. So addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, do we not have genetics involved in that? Most professionals would say that there is a genetic predisposition prediction. Do we blame the parents, the grandparents, the whole community because that's where you grew up? Do we blame the drug dealers? Do we blame the people who create the meth? Who do we blame? And does it make it any different when it comes down to what we have to do about it? Okay. So again, when it comes to obesity, who or what is to blame? And it, when it comes to any of these things, what is the reason we want to ascribe blame? My grandchildren blame one another. Adults, myself included, much less frequently in the last 15, 20 years than in my earlier life, but I would blame my husband, or I would blame my mother, I would blame the whatever it is. Is that a very healthy solution to pretty much anything? I'm not sure. But doesn't it feel good to say somebody else or something else is to blame? Yeah. I was just talking to my granddaughter about this yesterday, about how we don't get to say somebody made me do something. Because we have a choice. If her six-year-old cousin tells her to call somebody a name and she does it, it's not the cousin's fault. It's her fault because she chose to do it instead of saying, I'm not doing that. So, we're, you know, is, is blame a healthy adult solution to obesity, cigarettes, cancer? You know, I don't know. I think not, but hey, Psychology Today an article in there talks about why we like to have something or someone else to blame. Because blame is a great defense mechanism, right? Hey, it ain't my fault. my fault. I got the genetics. Hey, it's not my fault I'm on this medication. Hey, it's not my fault I'm just too busy. Hey, it's not my fault my mom was overweight. Hey, it's not my fault my grandma fed me too much. Hey, it's not my fault there's a fast food joint on the corner. Hey! It's a defense mechanism. You can call it projection. You can call it denial. You can call it displacement. Call it whatever you want. But when we blame, we do it because it helps us preserve our sense of self-esteem. Because I don't want to acknowledge. I don't want to be aware of my part in this. It's like an argument with my husband. I want it to be his fault. I want to say it's your fault. If you hadn't said this, I wouldn't have said that. Not true. I'm responsible for anything I say, right? But I want it to be somebody else's fault because I don't want to look at, oh, I just did this or said that, and that was really inappropriate and not nice at all. I don't want to acknowledge it. 
Blame is something, it's a tool, right? We use it when we're in attack mode, right? If we're feeling attacked by the doctor or the nutritionist or the exercise person or the psychologist or the whomever, you know what? I don't want to deal with this. I'm going to blame. It's a conflict resolution method. I just want out of this. You know, I don't care. I'm feeling attacked. I'd rather hurt you. Make it your fault than deal with my discomfort. And it's easier to blame someone or something else than to accept any personal responsibility. So is it nice for someone suffering from the disease of obesity to hear, hey, it's not your fault? Yes. That feels good. It's like, oh my God, I always felt like this was my fault. I am so glad now to hear that it is not my fault. Whew. Let me off the hook. Now, let me tell you from my perspective of somebody who's worked in this field for a very long time, my fear with people hearing that, with, our, with, with the population of people hearing it's not your fault, is that what we then might hear, and this is not everybody, but a certain percentage of that pe that population, and I'm going to tell you, it's probably a lot because we hear what we want to hear. It's going to say, Phew, okay, then I can go about my life, do what I want to do, and eat what I want to eat, and when I want to eat it, because, hey, it's not my fault. Can't help it. Ooh, buddy, that is some scary, some scary thinking and some scary Sounding, those are some scary sounding words from my perspective. Because by saying it's not your fault, and I'm not saying it is your fault, mind you, but by saying it's not your fault, too many people are going to say, okay, well, then there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to throw up my hands. There's nothing I can do anyway. That is the last thing we want to do. That's the last message we want to have. Am I, you know, I'm a recovering addict. Am I responsible for the genetics? of having the disease of addiction? No, I am not. But does that completely take away any accountability or responsibility on my part? No, it does not. But if I just want to go, well, there's nothing I can do. It's, you know, it's an addiction. I'll tell you a very true story, more family stuff. My sister and her husband, both addicts of different sorts, right? Her husband, drug addict, street drugs, right? And so she is, you know, trying to help him overcome his addiction while she is living in a rent-controlled environment based on her income. And as part of that agreement, there's no smoking allowed. So here she is working on helping him with his addiction, focusing on him, focusing on him, focusing on him. And I asked her, I said, you're smoking in here. We were at her apartment. She said, yeah. I said, well, you can't smoke in here. Won't you get kicked out if they find you smoking? Well, it's an addiction. It made me just want to laugh my head off because here she is on him, on him, on him about his addiction. Like, there are things you can do about this, buddy. And when it comes to her, she's completely helpless about smoking in an apartment where she'll get kicked out of if she smokes in there because it's an addiction. So it's that self-serving bias, right? The fear I have when people hear it's not your fault is that they let go of any kind of accountability or responsibility. So please, it's not an all or nothing issue here. And personally, I don't see where blame has anything to do with this conversation. But let's talk about the specifics because obesity is a very complex issue. It's very multifaceted. There are numerous factors that increase a person's propensity for gaining weight. There are some things involved in this that you are absolutely not to blame for. You are not responsible for 100%. There are other factors that you are. All right. So let's look at some. We're going to talk about genetics. Clearly, there's a lot of research that talk about even a pregnant mother, right? The pregnant mother's diet can make a great deal of difference 
and could influence the future baby's body composition. All right, is it that baby's fault? Absolutely not. Just like if a mother uses drugs and the baby comes out addicted, it ain't that baby's fault, right? Also, women who gain excessive weight during pregnancy are more likely to have heavy three-year-olds. So if your mother gained a lot of weight, is it your fault that your chances of being overweight at three years old are increased? Of course it's not. So there are some things, there is some truth to this part of the disease is not your fault. Similarly, if you've got parents and grandparents who are obese, you know, the kids are more likely to have the disease of obesity, right? Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of research on this. I'm not going to go all, all through of this, but this is interesting. 40% of children with excess weight will continue to be heavy during their teenage years. And 75 to 80% of teenagers with obesity will maintain the condition into adulthood. That doesn't bode well. But the NIH, the National Institute of Health, says, and I am glad because there's more than just one piece of information to consider in this. The NIH says obesity is multifactorial, right? It's biopsychosocial behavioral influences. It may be inherited, they say, but it's not necessarily inevitable. Sometimes, according to the National Institutes of Health, the problem seems genetic because children adopt the eating habits and activity lifestyles of their parents. So again, how do we tease this out? How much of it is due to genetics? How much of it is to do with environment and what we're learned? There are hunger hormones that are very, very powerful. Are you responsible for those? Probably not, right? There's food addiction issues. Addiction has genetic components. Are you responsible for having the predisposition? No. Are you accountable for how you deal with that in your daily life? Absolutely. I'm an addict. If I choose to engage in the substances to which I am addicted, I'm responsible for putting those in my mouth. There's gut bacteria, right? So studies show that people with obesity have different gut bacteria than those who don't have obesity. So there's a lot of biology at play here. And clearly, some of this is nobody's fault. Absolutely. So for those things, you can go, whew. and yet, even with some of the biological markers or predispositions, there are things you can do to counter that, all right? Let's talk about environment, which can impact the development of obesity. We learn what we live. So again, like the NIH said, if you live in a family where unhealthy foods are eaten, and that is what you learn to eat, that's probably what you're going to eat later on in your life. So forming healthy dietary habits and exercise habits with our kids. And this is a place where you can take a lot of, of the uh, responsibility for your children is to help them develop healthy dietary habits and regular exercise. Because this, during their childhood, is probably the most preventable way of preventing them from the disease of obesity flourishing in their lifetime. So again, if we teach our kids to eat healthy when they're younger, they're probably going to eat healthier when they're older. If we feed them a diet of junk food, processed food, fast food, that's probably where their preferences are going to be. Now, we're going to talk about living in impoverished areas. That's a reality for a lot of people. So if it comes down to getting food that is less healthy or not eating, absolutely go for the food that's less healthy. That is something that some people cannot help. That part is not within their control. So for some people, that is not their fault. For other people, it is your option, right? If you have 
the ability, and if you have the privilege of being able to afford healthier foods, but you choose unhealthy foods, then that piece is on you. If the only food that's available to you is less healthy, then that is not your responsibility. So the important factor here is, again, not fault or blame, but what am I responsible for and what do I have influence over? And when it comes to those things over which you do have influence, you are responsible, right? Again, medical conditions, medications, there are some medications that are known to cause weight, including diabetic medications, although there's a whole new class that helps people lose weight. But there are some uh, insulins, there are some antidepressants, there are some antipsychotics that increase your appetite, right? Reduce your metabolism, maybe even alter your body's ability to burn fat. And so these things can cause weight. If you need to take these medicines, take the medicines. And the weight gain then is not your fault. However, if you talk to your doctor and find that there are some other medications, then use those. But, you know, some of this you can't, you cannot control, right? Another thing, hypothyroidism, PCOS, there are some medical conditions that can predispose you to weight gain and make it difficult to lose weight. Some of that you can't help, right? Now let's talk about nutrition education. Again, there are some people who live in areas where education is not readily available. If it is available to you, and if you are listening to this on your own electronic device, then I'm going to challenge you to accept the reality that nutritional education is available to you. Because if you've got a smartphone, if you've got internet, or you've got access to a computer, if you can get to a library and learn, you have access to this. Whether you choose to engage in it, that is your fault. And I'm going to say it just like that. That's your responsibility. It is available to you. And if you choose not to engage in that or to learn the skills, then, hey, buddy, that's on you or that's on me, right? If it's available to you and you turn it down, who are you going to blame? There's nobody to blame but you can accept responsibility for that. And healthy adults will accept responsibility for the things that they are responsible for. Now let's talk about emotional and psychological issues. Are these your fault? Some are, some are, right? So anxiety, depression, some of this stuff is biological in nature, according to some professionals. Maybe you have this, these things, and maybe you, there's nothing you can do about it in terms of having it. Can you seek treatment for it? Some people can, some people can't. Again, we're talking finances. We're talking availability. We're talking some things you can and some things you can't. If you can't, then that is not your fault. If you can, if you have an emotional or a psychological issue and you have the ability to get help for it, but you choose not to, then my friend, that's on you. So our responsibility as healthy adults is to say, over which of these things do I have influence? Which do I choose not to follow through with? If you've got the choice to get the education, if you've got the choice to get the therapy, if you've got the choice to get, I mean, there's a lot of free stuff online, my friends. Uh, hello, this podcast being one of those things. And if you know of these free things, your support groups at your bariatric centers, or online classes that are free, or free worksheets, or free downloads. There's a lot of free information made available to you to deal with, with depression, to deal with anxiety. If you have the funds to see therapists and you choose not to, again, that's on you. A lot of people deal with emotional eating. They deal with a lack of healthy skills, the knowledge of healthy skills to deal with stress and to deal with life events. And therefore, emotional eating has been their coping skill. Well, again, I'm going to say to you, this falls in the area of, yes, it's your fault. And we don't have to blame, but <laughs> stated in the context of this video where the topic is, 
is obesity your fault? I'm going to say, if you choose not to get the help for the things you can, then it is your fault. I don't like the word, but let's say it's your responsibility. You are accountable for getting the help you need that is available to you. There's so much free information available to you about how to avoid emotional eating, how to stop emotional eating, how to engage in healthy coping skills rather than unhealthy coping skills. There's a tremendous amount of information available for you. And if you choose not to engage in it, then you are responsible. So that's the emotional and psychological issues. Again, some you're not responsible for getting help. You are if it's available to you and if you have the means. And I'm going to say for many of these issues, you have the means because it's all on the internet for free. Personal behaviors. Ding, 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 ding. My friends, if you suffer from the disease of obesity and you are not at fault in regard to genetics and you are not at fault in regard to hormones and you are not at fault in regard to other biological conditions or diseases, I will give you that 100%, not, not your fault, not your responsibility. Your personal behaviors, however, are 100% your responsibility if you're of sound mind and body. Meaning, if you have the funds and the options and the, you know, if you have a car and can go to the grocery store or to the fast food place and you choose the fast food place time after time after time, sorry, that's on you. If you know that going to the grocery store is not a safe option for you because you can't get out of there without picking up things you don't need, and you choose not to order online and have those groceries delivered to you, that's on you. That's your responsibility. If you know that having such and such a thing in your home is going to set you up for a relapse or send you into a binge and you keep it in your home, 100% on you. Now, does that make it easy to change these behaviors? Of course not. Do I have compassion for that? Of course I do. I have suffered from anorexia. I have suffered from eating issues. I have suffered from weight gain. I have suffered from the disease of obesity. No, 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 I take that back. The disease of addiction. All the behaviors to seek treatment were on me, 100%. And it took a long time before I was ready for it. So I have compassion for that. But the bottom line is, at some point, you are responsible for choosing to get help or choosing not to get help. You are responsible for learning the coping skills. You are responsible for learning communication skills. You are responsible for learning about healthy boundaries. You are responsible for getting support to keep unhealthy foods out of your home. You are responsible for calling the support person when you are tempted to go to an unhealthy food place. Your personal behaviors, your food choices, the fact that you're busy, uh -uh, you're responsible. The fact that fast food is more convenient, too bad, you're responsible for what you put in your mouth, right? It's no easy, it's no... It's easier to open a container of Greek yogurt than it is to drive to the fast food place. So eh, take responsibility where you can. Accept the fact that that part is on you. Getting help or not getting help. Planning for your food or not planning for your food. Meal prepping or not meal prepping planning for the fact that you have three kids in three sports and you take the cooler with you with healthy foods or not. Those things fall squarely on your shoulders and they are 100% your responsibility. And not having time, not having blah, 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 it's not an excuse. And I hate, I, I hate to be that blunt about it. I don't really know any other language than blunt. Now, do I have compassion for that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do I know how hard it is? Absolutely. Do I know how scary it is to face some of this stuff? Without a doubt. Do I know it can be done? Yes. Not just because I have done it, 
but because hundreds and thousands of people just like you have eventually made the choice to do it. And you can too. You can too. But not if you're going to blame. Not if you're going to blame the weather for not exercising. It's too hot or it's too cold or it's too humid or it's too whatever. You don't have to pay for a gym. You can exercise at home, even in a chair. There's no excuse to not move your body unless you're physically incapable, right? There are very few excuses for not putting forth the effort, right? So of course people want to say it's not my fault because if I don't, then I have to say, shoot, I am responsible. Shoot, I am accountable. And that ain't no fun because that makes us feel bad. And some of us already feel bad enough. Get the help you need to not feel so bad. Get the help to overcome the shame, the guilt. Get the help you need to establish the belief that you are worth it and you are. You and I and your neighbor and the person in every other country and continent of this world stand us all up in a line, my friends, and every one of us has equal value as a human being. Whatever our diseases, whatever our shortcomings, whatever our our past behaviors, whatever our transgressions, we all have equal value. And when we learn to treat ourselves as though we have as much value as our neighbor and our friend and the person in the other countries and continents, then maybe we'll be more receptive to taking accountability for the things we can change. Right? And that's what it's all about. It's about saying, yes, there are certain aspects of the disease of obesity that I'm not responsible for. They are not my fault. But my question to you is, where do you want to put your focus? Right? Do you want to put your focus on your efforts where something can be done? Or do you want to find something or somebody to blame? And will that help? Will it make you feel better? Maybe for a minute. But we all know deep down in our heart of hearts that we're responsible for certain aspects of managing whatever diseases that we have, right? So let's highlight the areas over which we do have some influence, the things we can change. Take home messages. What components related to weight, weight loss, Weight maintenance, do you have influence over genetics? Not so much. However, for future generations, you might, by setting them up to have healthy habits. Now you can prevent, even if people have the genetic predisposition, you can prevent a full expression of the disease of obesity. Environment, yep, most of us, most of us have some influence over our environment. And I will say there are allowances where there is food scarcity, where there is poverty, right? When you don't have the ability to afford hardly any food, then you absolutely eat what you can. And there, you know, we cannot judge that, right? But if you have the options and you have the choices and you have the knowledge or can get the knowledge, then you have some accountability. Medications and illnesses, Yes and no, we have some influence over those. Some of it we do not. Nutritional education for most people, yeah, you got influence over that. You can learn. Emotional and psychological issues, in many ways, yes. Again, seek out the information you need. Learn the skills that you need to learn and implement them. So second issue that I want you to take home with you is blame really a relevant issue to discuss when it comes to obesity and managing your disease? Well, maybe if you want to make yourself feel better. But if you want to make change, there are better places to focus your energy, such as what can I change and how do I go about making those changes and getting the help. I'm going to summarize with a statement from the National Institutes of Health. And what they say is obesity is one of the most difficult conditions to manage in healthcare. 
no one has found the correct solution because there is no one solution. Comprehensive programs dealing with obesity require coordinated actions at all nine levels of involvement, national, the food system, educational, medical, public health, municipal, societal, parental, and individual. Parental, this is the National Institute of Health, parental and individual responsibility, choice, and self-management, self-management, clearly have a place near the center of the stage in the obesity tragedy. Individuals are indeed responsible for their own health promoting behaviors, but should be held accountable only when they have adequate resources to do so. And I absolutely agree. In conclusion, says the National Institutes of Health, no one is to be blamed, but everyone has a collective responsibility for working to combat the obesity pandemic. That is beautifully stated. So what can you do to more efficiently manage those aspects related to your disease of obesity that you can? So here's my invitation to you. Invite other people to hear this, right? It may be hard to hear, but it's something we all need to hear. Every single one of us. I am responsible every single day for getting myself out to exercise or getting in my yoga room and doing some exercise. I am responsible for my health, just like you're responsible for your health. I'm responsible to learn the skills for healthy relationships, communication, boundaries with other people to help me in my journey of living a healthy lifestyle. So one thing you might want to do is maybe choose accountability over blame and excuses. So how can I be accountable? So maybe work with a partner, find somebody who will do this with you and list the ways without shaming. We don't need to shame ourselves compassionately that maybe you do work to avoid taking responsibility for your health because it's only by acknowledging, remember the four aces, we have to become aware of what we're doing and what we are not doing in order to make the healthy changes. That's a big topic. It's an emotional topic and it's easier to blame than to take accountability, but we're not gonna make any progress that way. So let's take accountability for those things we can change. Learn the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference, right? All right, so this is one part of the bariatric care program, but we're doing all kinds of fun things. And we have a new feature every day on the Very Aftercare Facebook page called The Daily Take, where different people give motivation, education, inspiration, tools, skills. Come on and join us. Very Aftercare, www.bariaftercare.com. And as always, we're talking about your health. Your health is your responsibility this day and every day. All right, my friends, thank you for being part of this. I know it was a little longer episode, but this is super important and I'm very passionate about it. So pass it on. Thanks, my friends. See you next time.